God of peace, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up this church community and all the people who make it up and those who are right now outside of our view, taking steps to join us. We lift up in trust and gratitude. We are holding space for them, open to the gifts they will bring. Holy Spirit, we invite your guiding voice to speak to each of us individually and to us as a group. Show us how to do the work you have for us. Use us to create a place of refuge, Guide us to invite others up into the beauty of your love and connection. May we truly listen for your voice. And when we hear it, may we each individually and as a community reply, here I am, Lord, use me. We are all called to travel on the same road and in the same direction to stay together. We have one faith, one baptism, one God of all people who works through all and is present in all. Everything we are and think and do is permeated with this oneness. Spirit of life, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen. Here's our, today we're talking about old words and traditional understandings. That's our theme for today. So can anyone tell me what a Davenport is? A couch. Yes. A couch. Oh, good. It's All right. Couch. So that's, that was practice round. No, nothing's going to be awarded there. All right. In this building, so you have the entryway, the lobby. What's an older word for that space back there? Narthex. All right, good job. Over here by the coffee corner, behind here there is a room, and I'm going to give you a hint, where the sacraments are prepared. Does anyone know what that room is called? Sacristy. Sacristy. All right, the sacristy. Now this gets a little tougher. No, Brian's using air quotes, all right, for sacristy. On this side of the sanctuary is another room. Does anyone, without a hint, does anyone know what that room is called? No, that's not a bad guess. What's that? Did you speak called Eleanor's club? Yes. It's called a vestry. Oh, right. Oh, so now everyone's like, oh yeah, I knew that. I knew that. And so that would be where the vestments are kept. Now, does anybody know what vestments are? And here's a hint, you're looking What's at What's your worry? Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So as far as this outfit goes, this is a ministerial uniform. Does anyone know what this is called, the white part? And I'll give you a hint, it's not a robe. And oh, thank you. Yes, an all, A-L-B. <clears throat> it's an older, and we're going to talk about this a little bit, because some of you are thinking, why is Pastor Bo wearing a dress? <laughs> and, which there would be nothing wrong with that, but it's not. It's an all. And this is not a scarf, but it starts with the same letter. Anybody know what this is? Oh. Oh, all right. You guys, all right, you're getting this. This is pretty good. Here's where it gets a little trickier. The table runner here. The thing, the banners that we hang around during the liturgical year, we change them according to colors for Easter and Christmas and normal time. Does anyone know what their official is called? What the, the category is called? Pyramids. Pyramids. Head of the class right here, teacher's pet. <laughs> Pyramids is the category that we use for the decorations. And that's interesting because it's from old Latin and it means to prepare. It's part of preparing the sanctuary for uh, worship. All right, last one. Oh, two more. The communion plate, we're gonna celebrate communion a little later. The communion plate has a name. Does anyone know what that's called? What's that? Say it louder. A pet. Yes, close, it's very close. We have lots of fancy words for all of the different things that happen around here. Some of you are like, I had no idea this was so involved. But everything that we do is very intentional and it has developed over a long history. It has evolved. And some of these old words or understandings are sort of vestigial tales, if you will, that stick with us even when we don't know the word or the concept anymore, they hang around. So here's your last one for the day. This communion table here, where we put the elements for communion, some people call it something other than a table. Anyone know what that is? An altar. 
What an interesting thing to call a table. Why would you call it an altar? What happens on an altar? You offer things. Exactly. Yeah. So what's interesting is that some of these names are fairly <laughs> innocuous. Some of them don't come deep with meaning and they're sort of interchangeable, right? It's not that important. But some of these words and concepts come with deep theological and spiritual implications. Because to call this an altar is a very strange thing for Protestants, which Methodists are, Protestants to do. To call it an altar is to say that there is a sacrifice present. But that is a theological understanding that says what happens here with the bread and the cup isn't just a ceremony. It's not a ritual. It's not a, a you know, a, a nice little thing we do. It's not, it's not just symbol. We elevate it to something about a sacrament. So there's this whole new vocabulary that comes in around sacrament. And it says that this table is different than other tables. And this bread might be a little different than other bread. And what we do here, using it in a worship context, sets it apart as a different category of things. So it might be different in degree, but some people think it's different in type. And our words actually convey that that's not just a normal room. That's where you prepare the sacraments, right? That's the sacristy. And this is where you keep the vestments. And that's the vestry, right? And this isn't a table. It's an altar. And you think, what have I gotten into? Because all of a sudden, this thing went from being like, you know, beautiful stained glass and some nice colored banners hanging around. And, right? And, and we're going to celebrate this thing. And seems to be really meaningful for people. And all of a sudden it is embedded. It is infused with a depth of theological implications. I am very aware that when we come to the table, that there are all sorts of things that come with us that we may not even be aware of. I, I want to give you an example. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, one of the famous passages of scripture that has to deal with this whole subject begins in verse 27 when Paul says, Whenever therefore, whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and the blood of the Lord. So examine yourselves and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all of those who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment against themselves. Well, that has been interpreted in recent years in a very interesting way. So some people think that this bread and this cup are not only different because they're a sacrament from other bread and other cup, but they think that the person who blesses it, who says the words, right, of instantiation, that the person who does the, the invocation, that that person has to be a special person. So this is called sacramental, but when the person who blesses the bread and the cup, that's sacerdotal or sacerdotal, some pronounce it. And that means that the person themselves, as in our case, as an ordained clergy person, has the right to do that. Well, we usually celebrate communion on the first Sunday of the month, but we didn't last week because I was camping. And so we decided to have communion this week since I'm here and I can bless the elements. So this stuff isn't trivial. It's not insignificant. Our understandings that come with us to the table have deep implications. Well, here's where it gets really tricky is that some people have said, not only is this special and the person who blesses it special, but you better be special just to have it. And they quote passages like this that says, if you take this in an unworthy manner, and in America, unfortunately, that has come to mean a personal piety or a standard of holiness. So if you have sin in your life, then you're not allowed to come and take this because if you did, you'd be drinking judgment upon yourself. 
Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> but if you read the passage in context, one of the better interpretations, what Paul's saying is, hey, church, we got a problem. Because when we all come together for this unity dinner, this love feast, those of you who have more wealth don't have to work as long hours. You all get there early and you start drinking and you start eating the best stuff. And by the time those in our community who are still out in the fields and still working long hours get there, you're already full and a little tipsy and you have taken this meal in an unworthy manner. You've gotten ahead of yourself and you allowed your privilege to actually separate what is supposed to be a unity meal, a love feast. It actually has for you become a judgment on your inconsiderate and uncaring ways of not waiting for those who need to come. And without them, we are not a complete body. But in America, because we're such individualists, we say if you drink it solo in an unworthy manner, meaning you have sin in your life, because that's the, the Puritan thing, right? So basically, if you've had any fun this week, you should be sorry about it before you come to this table. Otherwise, you're in big trouble, Missy. But in context, this is a justice issue where Paul is saying as a congregation, as a collective, make sure that what we do when we're together is actually appropriate for the symbolism that's in the meal. If we're going to say that this is unity, that there's one body and one cup, if we're going to do that, then you got to wait till everybody's there, including those who work for you in your fields. So there's a, a justice issue involved. But when you don't read this in proper context, what it becomes is people have to live up to a certain standard of piety or their personal holiness, or they're not allowed to take this. And so I have fellow ministers, some of my peers who have actually taken, and you'll see it in the news from time to time, that somebody will say, that politician shouldn't be allowed to take communion. They should be denied Eucharist or something like that. And so I know some ministers who have actually taken possession of the table and have said, if you're not living up to a certain standard of holiness or in the community, then we're going to deny you communion. And one of the reasons this freaks me out so much and troubles me so deeply is that those same people often believe that these elements, the bread and the cup, are actually a means of grace, an actual means by which grace comes to the sinner, to the human. And I want to say, what have you done? Good God, man, what have you done? If you think this is a means of grace, how dare you deny it from somebody who clearly could use a little extra grace <laughs> because they don't live up to your standard? If this is a means of grace, then we should do what we practice here, which is called an open table. You don't have to be a member. You don't have to be a confessing Christian. You don't have to sign a doctrinal statement. You don't have to be anything. Everyone is welcome at the table. It's the whole point of grace is that it's not earned. It's a gift. Does anyone want to say amen? I'm preaching. I'm, I'm preaching. I don't usually... I don't even preach. I'm just <laughs> fired up about this. <laughs> because when you and I come to this table, we bring all of this with us. We bring the early church's understandings that are remnants. We bring our parents' understandings, maybe from a different denomination or a different tradition. If we have a Jewish perspective and understanding on Passover, if we come from a Catholic background or an Anglican background or a non-denominational background, and we come, we bring all of this with us. And so it's all present, all at the same time. Because as Paul Ricoeur says, there is a surplus of meaning in any symbol this rich there is no way that you and I can explain it all 
or contain it all. We can't diagram the holy mystery. What we do know is that we have been given a model, an invitation to commune, to be a part of one another's lives, to break bread and be at table as one group. Some of us highly educated, some of us not so highly educated, some of us quite wealthy, some of us not very wealthy, some of us with kids, some of us without kids, divorced, married, all over the spectrum. We come and are one, we are united as one by this ceremony or ritual or what I'm gonna say is sacrament. And so I think that the invitation is not for you to have to live up to a certain standard in order to qualify to come to the table. Well, what I've really come to see is that actually this table transforms every other table you'll sit at this month. Every coffee table, every dinner table, right? Every table you sit at becomes holy because the Lord is present. And in the same way, this bread reminds us that all bread is sacred and a gift. Everything that sustains us and nourishes us. And that this cup reminds us of the potential of every cup, the host, if you will, the host of heaven that welcomes grace poured out. In fact, this little ceremony or ritual, the symbol that we participate in, the sacrament, has actually become a lens for many of us through which we see the rest of the world and through which we interpret the rest of human existence. That Jesus received, that he blessed and said, this is good. Then he broke because nothing it can remain an idol, a sacred cow must be broken so that it can be shared. And that's an invitation of a way of life for us, that we receive the good things, we bless them, we say that they're good, we break them so that they don't become idols, so that we can share the good things with those around us. I love how things evolve and change over time. I mentioned the vestments, the alb and the stole. It's fascinating. This actually goes back to the earliest centuries of the church. This is actually a Roman uh, uniform. But when the Methodists about 300 years ago were deciding to go their own direction after the Anglicans gently encouraged them to do so. <laughs> the Church of England said, why don't, why don't you all go get your own house? <laughs> and so as they migrated out, one of the conversations was about whether to keep these ministerial garbs. It turns out the conversation turned into a justice issue because for clergy who came from high standing and clergy who came from very low standing, to wear the same thing on Sunday meant that we were all playing on a level playing field and that our fashion didn't distinguish us as higher class and lower class, but that by all wearing the same thing that it actually made for a level playing field. And in recent years, an amazing thing has happened. Some of us who come from more of a rock and roll background and wanna move away from the Alban Stoll have been reminded by our female colleagues, actually, we love the Alvin Stoll because for women to take fashion out of, to a degree, out of the criteria by which we are evaluated and for all of us to be in similar garb levels the playing field and that for some of us, this is a justice issue. And it's amazing because if you didn't know and I just sort of wore this around, you'd think, 
is that his Halloween costume? <laughs> right? It looks so out of place. But actually, if you understand how it has come to be and how it's evolved and how it has come to us, it actually is rich with meaning. I mean, it's full of understandings that have helped people along the way and continue to hold deep meaning for people. Well, the table is no different. So when we come in a moment, I want to invite you to come as your whole self, knowing that we have an open table. This is what grace is about. It's not because you are up to a certain standard or believe right things or a member of the right club or whatever it is that we are all equal when we come to the table. It is a level playing field. And it's one of the things I love about this sacrament is that it unites us as a congregation so that when we go out into the world, that every piece of bread and every cup and every table we sit at, we understand is full of the divine mystery and the potential of God's presence. Because we have been at table, and we've received the bread, and we've taken of the cup, and we have been transformed in our understanding of this invitation to a way of life. So I'm going to ask Aaron to come. He's going to sing a familiar song for us. It might sound a little different on the guitar, but I think that you'll recognize it. And as it is familiar to you, I invite you to sing along. And then we're going to celebrate communion together.